Believe it or not, what you just saw was footage from a basketball game, an FMV basketball game, full motion video. Man, they were sitting down doing crunches like Squidward because they really thought this was the future. Let me explain. FMV games use the technique of recording real life footage and trying to make a video game out of it. Mostly how it goes is you have to press the right button at the right time to, let's say, activate a winning cutscene to progress. If you didn't, you'd see something like this. That was the security guard you shot. I don't give a fuck. This was mostly a thing in the 1990s when early CD games were being introduced. Because these games are on CD, you can implement footage and this is how they did it. Now, the tech wasn't quite there yet, so that's why the footage in these games looks like someone downloaded a clip off of LimeWire and uploaded it to YouTube. At 144p, there were whole companies who made these games, notably American Laser Games and Digital Pictures. Safe to say, neither one of these companies are around anymore. Now, when it comes to these FMV games, we have drag your crosshairs across the screen and shoot. Drag your crosshairs across the screen and shoot. In a Western. Drag your crosshair across the screen and shoot. At a crime scene. Let's kick butt. Drag your crosshair across the screen and shoot. In another western. Drag your crosshair across the screen and shoot. In space. You can donate a year's worth of salary to charity, and that still wouldn't be as generous as me saying these games have gameplay. Besides those games, it's mostly interactive movie type games. The most infamous FMV game is Night Trap. This game was one of the games that helped create the ESRB, believe it or not. I guess because you can put a giant alien BDSM necklace on a girl or some shit? I, I really don't know. But yeah, sports games. Maybe we'll look at these games in some detail in the future if this video gets at least 1 billion likes. But we have Prize Fight, Quarterback Attack with Mike Ditka, and Minnesota Fats. Pool legend. Yeah, my boy. Minnesota Fats. Minnesota FAT in the place to be. <laughs> I have no idea who this man is. Yeah, sorry, my pool knowledge doesn't extend much past the mini clip game and the GTA games and that version they had on PlayStation Home. Wow, remember that? Or that episode of Drake and Josh? Can you even make references to old Nickelodeon sitcoms anymore? I mean, on like a moral level. Uh, anyway, one FMV sports game to be released is Slam City with Scottie Pippen. What you gotta get? What you wanna get? Wanna get respect. So how do you earn respect? Welcome to the city, the slams with no pity. I hope you're ready to slam, slam, slam city. If you're committed to hard hit, good bit, cause ain't nobody tricking, sticking, scotty pit. Man, I hope that song isn't copyrighted. Ball. In Slam City, you have to play games against four different opponents. The opponents are as follows. A I'll say zesty individual. But you look good. Really. A girl, a meathead, and a dumbass. Ball. <sighs> and after you beat all of them, you face an individual who encompasses all four of those traits. Scotty Pippen. <laughs> like, why Scotty Pippen? Was every other NBA player busy? Whoa, 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 stop writing that comment. We do not care. Playing Slam City is unlike any other basketball game ever. When first playing, I had no clue what was even happening. 
I don't even press buttons and the camera's moving all over and everything. You have to stop thinking of this as a traditional basketball game. Pretty much you have to look at the defender and wait for them to make an opening and that's when you can press a button to activate a cutscene where the ball is dunked. And you can shoot the ball. That's offense. That's literally it. You can once in a while jump for a weird looking rebound that doesn't work half the time. But that's really it. On defense, it's way worse because the guy is like dribbling towards the camera and you're at the mercy of how well the cameraman keeps the ball carrier in the middle of the frame. He doesn't. You're supposed to cut off the ball carrier and go for steals at the right time while you're in the right spot. And you'll activate a cutscene where you steal the ball and dunk it in. So pretty much the whole game is trying to trigger pre-made cutscenes. You yourself never attack the basket or dunk or do really anything. You just have to stand on a certain side of the screen and press a button at a certain time to win. There's only so many clips of your opponent defending or with the ball, so if you're like me and you're a gigantic loser, you can play this game long enough to start to memorize each clip and play accordingly. Yeah, this isn't fun at all. Like Pearl Harbor, man! <laughs> what? What the game is most known for are these cutscenes that happen after each play. Ball. Uh, yeah. These range from gambling to hitting on girls. Girl, I'll drink your bath water. You what? Bro, I don't even know if I hate this guy because of how gross he is or because of how ahead of the time he is. Much like the start of the video, this is the most interesting thing in the whole game. Though I don't understand the sound mixing. After every cutscene, the game adjusts your score with the loudest sound effect I've ever heard. After hearing this for hours, it's safe to say a little hearing aid emoji will soon be in my most used emojis. I just let matches play out just to see what little cutscene I get next. <laughs> this extends to the people you play against too. This guy named Fingers. You want some of this? You got it. I called him Zesty earlier because, well, look and listen to how this guy plays defense. Come on, Ace. Like, why does he do this? Hey, if I start sweating, let me know. Cause I ain't going out like that. Just when you thought it was bad, then the next girl has these crazy innuendos. And the best part is, I don't even know if these are actually supposed to be innuendos or not. Boy, I'm gonna drink you like milk. Foo! I'll stuff it so far down your throat you'll look pregnant with twins. Ah, he came down on you like a jackhammer. Make him call you daddy. <laughs> What the hell kind of game is this? See white man can jump! Ah! <laughs> Everyone unsubscribe, I've, I've lost my way. Well, the fun and games are over after you beat the girl because the next guy is Mad Dog and this guy just wrecks my shit. <laughs> I feel like there's hardly any openings against this guy. Like tell me, when and where am I supposed to go? He doesn't have a tell as far as I can see. On defense, it's even worse because sometimes as soon as the ball is checked to him, a cutscene plays where he scores. Like seriously, he doesn't even have the ball for a femtosecond before the game decides he scores. Like what am I even supposed to do here? This is number one bullshit. After finally scraping by Mad Dog, we face Smash. Ball. Now take everything I just mentioned with Mad Dog, but Super Saiyan multiply it by 50 with this guy. I can't do anything against this guy and his jazz hand defense. At least with Mad Dog, I can try and shoot the ball immediately. But this guy just blocks you. And let me tell you, these are some of the most hellacious blocks I've ever seen in my whole life. What did you think would happen? Ah! 
there's just a whole bunch of background spectators getting murdered by basketballs. This kid's definitely on crack right now. So after enough perseverance, and when I say that, I mean just memorizing all of his clips, we beat him. And we try to move on to Scottie Pippen, but we need more respect. Yeah, you've probably seen the respect score on the bottom of the screen. You get one bajillion points whenever you do something. So I read online to find out that you need one billion respect points to challenge Scottie Pippen. All of a sudden, the main theme starts to make a little bit more sense. I mean, do you do you really think I'm going to sit here for hours and grind out respect points against the same guy all night like some gigantic no life loser? <sighs> Roll the montage. Punk. Well, I'm glad that's over. We've accumulated enough respect points to make Aretha Franklin proud. So let's challenge Scotty Pib. What? I still need more respect. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the hell the reason is. I, I can't play against Pippin. The one billion points thing comes from people playing the Sega CD version while I'm playing on DOS. Maybe it's different. Who knows? But my respect levels ain't going any higher than this. <laughs> <laughs> so here's footage from a random Sega CD playthrough, and the footage is somehow even worse quality. I can't even make up a joke on how bad this looks. So everyone is celebrating on how much respect you've accumulated, and you can't even hear the characters talking because of the background music. A little wine over some ice, read some of my poetry. You know, speaking tongues, that pun. I can't hear you! Scotty Pippen pulls up in his van full of stolen Nike shoes, gives you a pair, and you play against them. Sign this contract, Ace. You're a pro now. Like me. So, like, I'm in the NBA now? Uh, I don't know. Well, you play against him and win. I can't tell you how difficult he is or anything because the player for this playthrough just runs by him every time. Maybe I just suck at the game. Man, you suck! Unfortunately, I can't put being proficient at Slam City on my resume. That would have gotten me hired just about any place. Slam City's legacy is, well, nothing really. Outside of that time, it was briefly mentioned in an angry video game nerd video. Crush him like a walnut and spring him up some It wasn't just an honor boy. What are they saying? Okay. This game has lived in relative obscurity and the FMV fad would die out along with the development studios that specialized in it. Slam City is not fun, but does have a sort of weirdness 90s charm, which is at least something. But the game still sucks. Like Pearl Harbor, man! Back in the prehistoric year of 1993, we had Madden and a bunch of other football games that are so indistinguishable you couldn't even tell me which games were which, even if $1 million were on the line. Most were just run-of-the-mill football games that had about as much impact as an online petition on change.org, and most of them would be promptly forgotten. One game managed to stand out of all of this at the time, and that game certainly wasn't Sterling Sharp end-to-end, -end. it was Mutant League Football. Mutant League Football is a football game where you play in a league that consists of mutants. Wow, thank you for watching everybody. I hope you enjoyed the video. I mean, there's an option of how often you want players to die, and there's a team called the 60 Winers. I don't know if that's a parody of the 49ers or just a nice 69 reference. Either way, it sets the stage for what you're about to play. Mutant League Football is just over the top. You have football fields that have stage hazards like landmines, lava pits, and bottomless pits. <laughs> All these things can kill you. That's practically the objective. You're a football player and you're killing other people. This game beat Ray Lewis by a good decade. It doesn't just stop at the players. You can even go ahead and kill the ref if you want. Killing the ref is only like a five yard penalty, but so is standing off sides. 
It's crazy to see that literal murder is given the same punishment as lining up wrong. Not even the court system is that bad. Well, maybe. Now having said all that, is Mutant League Football a good game? Eh, not really. The game has weird controls, which is par for the course when it comes to sports games of this era. And it's so choppy at times, it would be a smoother experience if you were to rapidly pause and unpause a YouTube video throughout its duration. There's not much reason to play today besides the novelty of someone dying during a football game, which is admittedly pretty cool. <laughs> It was a fine game for the time, and that was because the engine that was used to make the game was the same engine that was used to make Madden 93. This game was popular, believe it or not. I mean it. There was a spin-off called Mutant League Hockey, a planned basketball spin-off, and there was a TV series called Mutant League that I never heard of until doing research for this video. I mean, the series got a damn cartoon. Now, if that's the case, then why is it that Mutant League is practically non-existent today? EA. That makes sense. The only thing more murderous than a Mutant League football player is EA when it comes to their own IPs and development studios. Which is a shame, really. Sports games really started to boom in the early to mid-2000s, especially over the top arcade ones. I think Mutant League football would have fit right in with NFL Street and NFL Blitz. If I had to guess, it was because maybe the potential M rating that the game would most likely receive, and EA wanted no part of that. Or maybe the NFL stepped in and said that they don't want a game where you can blow up halftime performers for no reason to come from the same publisher that develops the Madden series. I'm just speculating. The only time we would ever see Mutant League football from EA again is when it along with dozens of other dead EA franchises, were shattered out into a compilation of games called EA Replay that was exclusively on PSP to ensure that nobody could buy it. Years would pass and series creator Michael Menheim would put up a Kickstarter for a spiritual successor called Mutant Football League, getting around the copyright by just switching two words around. I actually think he might be like some genius. And that's fitting because the game is 100% parody. Look at the team names. Crokelin Invaders, Grim Bay Attackers, Philadelphia Evils. It's not just the team names, the Crokio Dome, Evil Lesson, MFL. The players are parodies as well, including Airborne Dodgers and Hattrick Mahomies. Also references to Duke Nukem and a Xenomorph because why not at this point? Check this out. There's a guy named Sladrian Peterson and he's holding a tree branch. I wonder where they got the inspiration for this character. I mean, come on, don't stop there. Where's Homicide Hernandez? I mean, honestly, if you're an NFL fan scrolling through this, it's pretty fun. And each team has a description that mimics their NFL counterpart. So there's actually some lore here, believe it or not. As far as the actual game goes, it's pretty insane. Just look at it. Mutant League football actually resembles NFL Blitz a lot, even attacking players after the play is over. Great job. Now let's try to score a touchdown. The game has a lot of elements from its original Genesis counterpart. Killing is alive and well. Wait, what? Each player has this life bar, and when the life bar depletes, you die. It can be strategic to try and deplete a player's life bar as they have the ball, so a fumble is caused. But what would mutant football be without its mutant powers? I'll tell you. Football. Is that what you came here to see? Just football? On both offense and defense, you can go into a dirty trick playbook. These include things like pulling out a shotgun or a chainsaw or making the ball explosive. He might have managed to dig out a yard on that you can also revive dead teammates like a wish on the Dragon Balls. And you can bribe the ref. Bribing the ref means that the refs will call nonsensical penalties against the other team. So I guess this makes it closer to the actual NFL than we thought. In order to stop this, you can kill the refs. It's a jailbreak, and the defense jumps offside to kill the ref. Ho -ho. The game even lets you control the ref to run away from the other team trying to kill him. <laughs> Of course, nothing compares to the best power-up you can possibly imagine. Farting. That 
is a disgusting act. The hazards return and they have some differences. Like, look at the ice walls in not Lambeau Field. I was actually able to take advantage of them during an onside kick and get the ball back. One of my many pet peeves when it comes to arcade football games is that they don't change the field or add any interactable objects except the legendary football game Jerry Rice and Nidus Dog Football. The graphics. That's, you know, that's really what this is all about. Anyway, let me do a Lambeau leap. Oh shit. The dirty tricks are fun, and when you have multiple of them going on at once, things get pretty hectic. Really have a way of extending the red zone on account of all that blood. And that's how you run the football. Oh, holy Montezuma's revenge. That's a crap your pants and die tackle. Well, that's fun. The game suffers from the same problems as a lot of arcade football games do. It's specifically playing defense in general. Yes, it's fun to send players to the Shadow Realm via Chainsaw, but on any ordinary play, the defense is just not fun. It's only useful to control a defensive lineman that's rushing in. Trying to play zone or, heaven forbid, man-to-man -man defense is so hard due to the fast-paced nature of the game. For defensive passing, the AI just lets balls zip right over their head like a Dave Chappelle joke that's being told to a white kid from the suburbs. As far as defending passes go, there's no button to do interceptions or to swat the ball. It's automatic. So yeah, you can imagine the amount of times I was in the perfect position to pick off a pass, but I do nothing instead. This is number one bullshit. Stuff like this is annoying, and unfortunately you'll see it a lot considering playing defense is a huge part of football. As far as commentary, we have NBA Jam and NFL Blitz announcer Tim Kitzrow. Oh no, I'm sorry, I mean Grim Blitzrow. Welcome to NFL Game Day. Grim Blitzrow here. He does a good job, but overall the commentary is pretty hit and miss. It's funny sometimes, but the other commentator who is also voiced by Kitsro is doing his absolute best to do the most grating voice that's humanly possible. Oh, holy Montezuma's revenge! That's a cracker pants and die tackle! Now, that Montezuma was very vengeful, but he breaks wonder what made him so mad. Yeah, probably all the diarrhea! Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, they probably ran out of toilet paper when he was in some all-inclusive resort, and he just got so mad and cursed everyone who came to Mexico forever to crack them. What the fuck are you talking about? After a while, I think the sound of microwaving a toaster would be more preferable to listen to. There's not just commentary though, the players themselves have things to say after big plays. It's a little disappointing there's no voices for these, but they're more often than not pretty funny. And uh, I don't even think I can comment on some of this stuff. This adds some personality to the game and hey, I like it overall. Mew and Football League is actually different from other sports games in terms of content because they actually supported the game post-release as opposed to just releasing it and then waiting till next year. The game would end up adding a dynasty mode for just five bucks. Now, this is something they didn't really have to do, but it's more than welcomed. It starts off with the painfully stereotypical sports cliche of your team is full of losers and you, as an underdog, have to do the unthinkable and win the mutant bowl. That's about as original as a butterfly tattoo. But this is a pretty good mode that adds some more longevity to the game. You build your team up with experience points, signing free agents, and making trades. You have a budget to account for, and you can't just shove steroids into your ass like you can in Blitz the League, but you can't bring guys back from the dead, so it's almost like the same thing. Live from your grave. You work your way through the season to eventually play and win the Mutant Bowl, and after that, you try again in order to create a dynasty. Hence the name of the mode. When you're done with Dynasty, you could take your murderous ways online, where the game is, in my opinion, at its most fun. You'll be waiting 7,318 hours to actually find a game, but when you do, it's really fun and no lag. Wow. I even made some kid rage quit. Aren't I the greatest gamer ever? The long wait times to find a game has to be indicative of how the game sold. I can't find any sales data on Mew and Football League, but someone who only has 26 wins is in the top 20 leaderboard on PlayStation and the game has been out for years at this point. Overall, Mew and Football League was a return to the crazy football madness of the original. 
It's mostly fun, mostly funny, and all gruesome. I mean, to celebrate a win, you rip your opponents in half. Talk about being a sore winner. I'm impressed with how well the game looks and feels. The animations are brutal and everything makes sense. Well, as much sense as a rolling extraterrestrial scoring a touchdown could, looking at other indie football games struggle so much while being years in development while this game just leapfrogs over them shows how much care they put into the game. Mutant Football League seems mostly obscure nowadays. There's hardly any talk about it online or even on YouTube, and I felt like the game just came and went like a fart in the wind when it was released. Maybe time was too harsh to a series that was dormant longer than the Cold War. Okay, I made that up. But it is true that this game has made little to no impact. That's not going to stop development of a sequel though, as Mutant Football League 2 has been announced. Hopefully we get an even better game. And hey, this game has a mini game at halftime where you kill a bunch of refs with a gun. So I strongly recommend this game for Detroit Lions fans. Ladies and gentlemen, Rey Mysterio is dead. Oh, never mind. He's right here, I guess. Not the first time he's been thrown off a roof and survived. WrestleMania X8 on the GameCube is one of the most boringest wrestling games you can possibly play. So boring, I'm completely ignoring the fact that me saying most boringest makes me sound like English is my 87th language. Now, the reason I bring this up is because the next WrestleMania game on the GameCube goes in the complete opposite direction. For WrestleMania 19, you have this mode called Revenge Mode, where you quite literally slaughter innocent people just trying to do their blue collar jobs. And I'm serious. Whether it's the construction site or the harbor with water, no one is surviving this. They try and use some ambiguous language like take out or get rid of, but then having loading screens that say life or death. Yeah, these dudes are in a shadow realm, quite literally, considering how dark it looks down there. So let's start by picking a wrestler. You can pick anyone you want except Vince himself. So I can't beat the shit out of people as Vince, but don't worry, I can pick Brock Lesnar and beat the piss out of people instead. But I decided to go with the hurricane. Stand back. No, seriously, stand back. He'll kill you. So the story starts off with two security guards throwing you out Flintstone style and you land at the feet of Stephanie McMahon. She's thankful I'm not Snitsky. Then she informs you of this plan that makes absolutely zero sense. I see revenge in your eyes. Maybe we can help each other out. See, I can offer you a chance to get back at the very man who ruined your career. I devised a plan to hit him where he will feel it the most. WrestleMania 19. And if WrestleMania doesn't take place, then Vince will be ruined forever. Are we on the same page? Nope. Yeah, I mean, let's just go with it. It's obviously not something that's trying to shoot for an Oscar or anything. So you have four main areas to complete with each having six missions. In the construction site, we have to stop the construction of the WrestleMania arena. I know I just said to go with it, but WWE rents out arenas for WrestleMania. They don't build a new WrestleMania arena every year. Anyway, we are placed in an explorable area and we're just going around killing construction workers and security guards. The hurricane is here to save you from your minimum wage existence. You can also run into real wrestlers too. It's Christian. It's kind of odd that you can take out dozens of guards, but the two in the opening cutscene is enough to take you out. Like I mentioned earlier, there are six missions to do, so I'm not just killing guys, I'm trying to protect something or climb up something. Memes aside, I kind of regret picking the Hurricane because like half of his moveset is dedicated to pinning moves. Imagine getting into a fight with someone and they whip out a small package. Hey, yo! The, the wrestling move, I mean. Believe it or not, normal people don't abide by wrestling pinfalls, so this kind of sucks. After committing crimes that go unreported to the police, we destroy the WrestleMania arena. We head to the mall to uh, beat people up so bad you draw blood because the WrestleMania section is selling out merch. You know, those malls and their pesky WrestleMania sections. 
There you go. Take out that mall worker that has nothing to do with Vince or WWE. That'll show him. There's no throwing people off of things here, but this mission where you have to make four guys bleed is incredibly frustrating because making guys bleed is as random as spontaneous combustion. Sometimes I can make a guy bleed instantly, even with a move that doesn't even involve the opponent's forehead. But there are also times where I could just continuously elbow a guy and he just won't bleed. Come on. Bleed. God damn. This guy still hasn't bled yet. It's like he coated his head with flex seal before the fight. He's uncuttable. That's not all the mall has to offer. There's this challenge where you have to destroy a car and vandalize the mall in general. This announcer is amazing, by the way. Every time someone dies, he says, Eliminated. He says it with such joy, and whenever you break something, you hear, Smash! 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 Stephanie? Damn right I'm gonna, Smash! You have to stop Pest and others from getting a briefcase. What's in this briefcase? I don't know! But look at how this guy swings on a pole. Like, come on now. So we destroy the mall for some reason and we move on to the parking lot. Now, when it comes to the parking lot, I'm gonna take a different approach and start talking about the mode itself in terms of the problems it has. WrestleMania 19 is a wrestling game, right? As far as wrestling goes, it does its job pretty well, but it's taking a wrestling control and gameplay scheme and tries to throw them in these objective-based arena settings. And for the most part, it's just really awkward. You press Y to run and you can only run in a straight line. Once again, fine for No Mercy inspired wrestling games, but in this mode where you have to cross the street to avoid getting ass blasted by a car with no regard for human life, it's a little shitty. Eliminated. Mission failed. Damn. Wait, why the hell do the wrestlers do the original Crash Bandicoot death animation when they get hit? I mean, just look at how the CPU travels long distances. It's so awkward to see them zigzagging towards me. You're always locked onto someone, even if they're like five football fields away, which makes it even harder to fight multiple guys because I keep striking no one and looking off into the distance, even if I'm in the middle of speeding traffic. Also, I don't know if like 50% of the games in the PS2 era were released on opposite day or whatever, but I have no idea why so many games inverted the camera back then. Let's also mention that this parking lot area introduces platforming. Yeah, that's right. There are sections of this game where you jump from a stripper pole to chains that are hanging up to get to the other side. Nathan Drake, eat your heart out. Besides being even weirder than anything else, the controls for these sections are just awful. The camera is just obstructed and it makes it hard for you to line up your jumps. Not to mention that there are several goons here who have the power to shake metal so hard it vibrates with such force that it knocks you down. So as you can imagine, all these factors combined makes this multitasking effort of avoiding cars, incapacitating goons, climbing, then swinging to a platform to take out Vince's personal bodyguard by giving him the Mufasa treatment. No. Eliminated. To be pretty difficult. <laughs> Look, I can attack people with my butthole. <laughs> oh, oh, that's the wrong button. No, no! But yeah, the parking lot offers missions like destroy a car, destroy a truck, and swing to obtain my payment that Stephanie's placed onto a hanging chain for some reason. Also, how am I going to get down from here? Hey man, if those falls don't kill you, those medical bills will. So we now move on to Big Shell from Metal Gear Solid 2. 
but instead of just sneaking, we're throwing more people off of legends instead. This area adds some new wrinkles. There's this triple cage you can break and climb up or just break the floor. But for the most part, throwing people off of things, yeah. The one standout being that you have to traverse this area and at the end of it, you need to carry a box up to the top of these steps to climb on. A nice way to change the pace a little because it was obvious things are starting to get a little stale at this point. The final mission has you breaking into the control room that's guarded by The Rock, Hollywood Rock, the best rock, and some random ass boxer named Rowdy Smith. Oh. I have no clue who the hell this is supposed to be. I'm guessing Tyson? You break through and all the missions are complete. I guess you came here to collect the rest of your money. Well, you must not have read the fine print of that contract you signed. See, you don't get paid until you win the main event at my WrestleMania. That's right. You are signed up to face Vince McMahon at my WrestleMania. Yes, yeah, Steph, this makes zero sense. We tried to destroy WrestleMania the whole entire time. Like, did you have an entirely separate construction crew build a whole new stadium in like half the time? Shouldn't I be in jail? Why do you sound like you have a nasal cold and you're talking into a blue snowball mic? Why is Goldberg hot dog colored? Not gonna lie, I thought this was Taz. I don't know anymore. We head out to fight and finally make use of the Hurricane's pinning maneuvers and beat the game. Vince is ruined. I can't imagine anything else ever getting any worse for him. Now I want you to think about what kind of ending a game like this would have. Okay, here it is. So the ending of this game is Goldberg speeding in like you were holding square in a modern Sonic the Hedgehog game to spear Stephanie and send her to a darker realm that's even darker than the hole you throw the construction workers down. Like there's nothing but money in the air, not even particles left. All right, roll credits. WrestleMania 19's revenge mode will go down as one of the most out there concepts for a wrestling game. Having your whole mode being outside of the ring and having little to nothing to do with wrestling is odd. There are games like WCW Backstage Assault and Backyard Wrestling, but those games are still wrestlers having wrestling matches. The closest thing I can think of is WWF Betrayal on the Game Boy. You go around beating people up in a similar fashion. But I can't figure out why this mode was made or the reasoning behind it. It was released in 2003 when GTA was taking over the gaming world. Maybe they were inspired to create their own cop killing, uh, I mean security guard getting rid of game. The mode itself is fun, but the main thing bringing it down is its awkward control. Wrestling controls just don't fit this environment. Imagine playing Super Mario 64, but you have like Resident Evil 1's tank controls. Oh wait, there's actually a game like that. Well, in any case, I should be seen as a hero and a upright member of society because I just made a video about wrestlers killing innocent people and I didn't make a single Chris Benoit reference. NHL Rock the Rink is an over-the-top arcade game. It's weird because the game doesn't feature any NHL teams or players without unlocking them first. I never heard of another sports game that does this. EA published this game, but it's not under the EA Sports label, which is pretty weird. Playing the game is just madness from the menu music. <laughs> To the gameplay. You can hit other players, do wrestling moves to them, check them into the stands. It's a damn free for all. You have special shots that twirl you all around as if you're a ballerina on ice, which I guess is a figure skater, but anyway. You fill up your bonus meter, and when it fills up, it's the hypest shit. This is the video game equivalent of a bowl of frosted flakes. After enough time, you can enter fighting mode, and it's terrible. I don't think these two are here to discuss poetry, which is too bad, really, because poetry can teach us so much about ourselves. Have you ever seen shin punching in a fight before? Like, well, like, what is this? Yeah, just look. You don't need a lengthy speech to see why this sucks. I like your kaji. 
thankfully fighting is optional. The controls are a little weird though. Circle hits, but circle also speeds you up. Why not just use any of the other buttons on the controller? I hate when games do this. Outside of that, this is a fun game. And he puts it upstairs where Grandma keeps Granddad in an urn. Which is sad, really, because Granddad is still alive. What the hell? The main mo- the main mode is NHL Challenge mode. You play teams and beat them to unlock them while earning upgrades for your team. And the game gets progressively harder as you go. NHL Rock the Rink is a game game. Pop it in and have a gay old time. No tutorials or anything like that. Here's a hockey game, play it. The game is best when it's just pick up and play with friends. Critics liked it, but this one line from the IGN review caught my eye. Rock the Rink is a surprisingly fun and addictive video game experience. Even though I really went into the game wanting to hate it. What the hell kind of reviewer says that? One for IGN apparently. Bellator MMA, you may recognize them as the number two MMA company in the world, but to me, they're the company that almost had a fighter die from exhaustion. Gotta has no idea where he is. Little do we know there's actually a Bellator game, Bellator Onslaught. When you play this game, it just screams budgeted title. And yes, I'm aware that's what it is, but man, it's like shopping at Walmart and buying marshmallow mateys instead of Lucky Charms. There's only eight fighters to choose from and they're all from the featherweight and lightweight divisions. Not a real huge selection. I guess if you wanted to play any other weight class, you can go screw yourself. That loading screen music can start a party though. Since it's a budgeted game, they go for this simplified arcade style gameplay. You both have health bars and once one of them is depleted or someone submits, the match is over. Radio. That's all well and good, but this sucks. The striking animations look pretty bad, and since you have to deplete your opponent's health fully to win, there is no flash KOs. That takes away from the whole, the fight can end at any time shtick that MMA games normally have. You have basic button combos, blocks, and sways. That's the stand-up game. It's as shallow as a rain puddle. <laughs> Takedowns are the best thing this game has going for it because they're pretty brutal. and sometimes super over the top. But the takedowns lead to the ground game, which is the worst thing about this game. Grappling is even worse than the striking because nothing's responsive. Everything is centered on the right stick. Clinches, takedowns, submissions, transitions, and counters. But they're about as responsive as a potential second Tinder date. That's not at all if, if you needed me to clarify. I think you have a higher chance of sneaking into Area 51 undetected than you do successfully blocking a transition or submission. I mean, just how fast do you have to react? It's like you have to move the right stick and just guess. In the end, the grappling just looks like two amateurs just rolling around with each other. The submission system is this degenerate thing where you have to button mash to escape. I was never a big fan of systems like this in any game. The stamina determines how easy it is for you to get submitted or you to submit someone. Submissions are the easiest way to win against AI. Just have them drain their stamina and then go for a submission. Sometimes you could stun your opponent and then you can go for a Bellator moment, which is admittedly pretty cool. Coco! You have a championship road mode, which is pretty much an arcade ladder mode. You have to go through the roster, but don't lose though, because you have to start all over. Oh man, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like watching Ink Masters on Spike TV. And lastly, you can create your own fighter, but the options are so limited, you shouldn't even bother with it. Eight face presets, eight hairstyles, eight pieces of facial hair. Look, if we were playing the lotto, that many eights in a row might be a good thing, but for here, it's not. You give your guy moves and go through trials to unlock more moves. So is Bellator MMA any good? Hell no! Legitimately, one of the saddest things I've come across is the publisher of this game, 345 Games, not to be confused with 505 Games or 343 Industries, posted things like patch updates to, of all places, GameFAQs boards, and they would only get like two or three responses at most. And those responses were just people saying that the game sucks. Man, I know I just crapped all over this game, but I really do feel bad. When it comes to street ball video games, we've had a lot of them. 
And we all know the likes of NBA Street and NBA Ballers, but we're not talking about those. I'm talking about a redheaded stepchild, a game that many of you, if not all of you, have never even heard of. Exciting Basketball on PS2. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, it's actually called the Basketball Exciting. We're already off to a great start when the title of the game sounds like it was run through six different languages in Google Translate. Also, removing the E in Exciting looks really cool, right? Nope. We'll give it a chance. After all, the PS2's library of games is so vast, maybe we'll find a hidden gem here. Oh my god. The cold, lifeless look in every player's face makes this the first ever horror sports game. Like, it's unsettling. It's like these dudes witnessed their whole family killed before their eyes, or it's like they're not even human at all. As a matter of fact, I don't think they are. They swing in and get rotated through like they're mannequins or something. The team names are just letters devoid of any kind of personality or humanity. And they can't even express facial emotion even when they win or are celebrating. That could only mean that these guys are robots and they have been built and programmed to do nothing in life but to play basketball. And boy, do they suck ass at it. Listen, I know I can be prone to hyperbolic statements, but I am not exaggerating when I say that this is the absolute worst home console physical basketball game I have ever played. I mean, just look at it. It's a three on three street ball game and there's nothing really street about it. You have these awkward passes and you can spin, I guess. That's about it. The animations for this game are horrible and not in a way where it's just badly animated. It's in a way where every player looks like they suffer from arthritis. From the dribbling to the shots. Oh my God, the, the shots. How could a human being end up with a jump shot that looks like this? How do you even get to the point where this is what your animation of a jump shot looks like? I have no clue. The gameplay itself is pretty bad. When you first start playing, it's just guys chucking up air balls and shooting from behind the backboard for some reason. Hey pal, you just blowing from stupid town? After you get a little used to how the game is, it's just super easy and exploitable. You could just Steph Curry it from half court with little to no difficulty. The AI is so bad, they never even attempt to stop you. You could just pull up for threes uncontested and everything. It's actually easier to make a three-pointer than it is getting an open layup because more often than not, your layup goes too far and you drive past the basket. The AI on defense is a joke. Like, is this triangle defense? I mean that literally speaking because they form a triangle. On offense, the AI is terrible. Their shots hit more air than a skydiver. Like, bro, I'm gonna give you a free lane to the basket. Okay, I'll give you another free lane to the basket. Okay, I'll give you another free lane to the basket. Okay, I'll give you another one. You can loop this forever if you want. I'm not playing on baby difficulty either or anything. There is no difficulty select. You can dunk, but I don't know how to trigger it. And when it does trigger, it's just like, eh. And sometimes it doesn't even count. Uh, what else? You could do this, whatever it's supposed to be. Yeah, I got nothing. <laughs> By the way, the back of the box says this is ghetto street ball. Just a fun fact. The game is so bland and boring in general. There are only three courts, there are no stats in these games, and you can't even switch between players on your own team. Not that that matters in any way, because everyone plays the exact same. I know they had these little different ratings, but I noticed none of it except for speed. 
Considering all the players move in this game like everything is in perpetual bullet time, that doesn't really matter. So is there one thing that this game does well? Well, yes, the music. This made the game just a tiny bit more bearable. The main mode in this game is arcade mode. The arcade mode tasks you to beat every team in the game, which isn't really a lot. It's about seven teams or something. To make things go even faster, I took the timer off and made it so the first team to score 11 points wins. Or, to simplify it even more, when I hit three uncontested half-court shots and a two-pointer, I win. Now, the more and more you play, the more and more you notice things like this. Your team win every time you win. Or this billboard. Good task, good time. Let's drink delicious coffee, no space in between the words, and spend comfortable time. It doesn't make any sense! Man, I, I don't know what happened here. After I play on and on and beat everyone until a new challenger approaches. Now take a wild guess. Who could it be? You are right if you guessed. Royalty free Chicago Bulls, boy! Yeah, I can't even believe it. I thought it was just gonna be some supernatural team or something, but here we are the 90s Chicago Bulls, and they look just as surprised as I am that they are in this game. So if these guys are the last boss, then they must be the toughest challenge yet. So I have to bring my A game in order to beat these guys. Hey Jordan, here's a free lane to the basket. Yeah, they suck too. The only thing I can notice is different is that they are faster. After we beat them, we are told game clear and we get the credits. After that's over, there's nothing else. The arcade lasts about 30 minutes. Granted, I changed the settings for the games to go by quicker, but nah. The only other person in the world who has a playthrough of this online is this guy who took him about an hour. So we'll split the difference and say 45 minutes. And even when you beat the game, you can't even play as the Bulls or King as they're referred to. As far as I know, you don't even get an unlockable. So after playing the game, I naturally have some questions. And the main one being what the hell is this and who made it and why? Well, that's three questions, but whatever. If the poorly worded title of the game and the overall bad English in general didn't give it away, this is a foreign game, Japanese to be specific. This game is part of the exciting sports series which contains four games. Basketball exciting, billiards exciting, volleyball exciting, and bowling exciting. None of these seem to be as bad as basketball exciting, and none of them are really all that, well, exciting. And the other games don't have these weird 1 million yard stares. Well, the bowling one does have one static expression, but at least it's not, you know. But the exciting series is inside of another series called 2000 Simple Series. Didn't know we were going all Inception here. These games were all published by Japanese publisher D3 Publisher. The purpose of this series is to create simple budgeted games. The number 2000 represents how much yen the game is supposed to cost. So about 13, 14 US dollars. Funny enough, rarely any of these games came over to America. Mostly Europe. This series is just full of everything, and I mean everything you could possibly think of. Any content creators or aspiring content creators have untapped a video potential here. You have games that spawn some pretty popular series like Earth Defense Force. You have obscure games like Basketball Exciting. And you have games where you can control a ship and shoot giant women in bikinis in their vaginas to defeat them. You know, like regular games. What the fuck is this? Girl working out, Kingdom Hearts clone, horror, toy helicopter. What are you blasting on those windows? Ew, you nasty ass bastard! 
half naked girls, half naked girls, half naked girls, half naked girls fighting, roller coasters, and baby competitions? Like, what? what is this? The Soul 2000 series has the great honor of having one of their games be the very worst rated game on Metacritic as a whole. There's a good amount of sports games on this list, so maybe if the moon and the stars and the planets all align, I'll visit that someday. Bringing things back to basketball exciting, it's one of the worst games I've ever played. Even with the added context of this being a cheapo $14 game, every other game in this series doesn't look like a disaster, at least in terms of the gameplay. Like, I can play these games in a I'm bored and I need to kill some time sort of way. This game isn't even good for Cartoon Network Flash game standards. Basketball Exciting would live in relative obscurity for years until NBA 2K social media discovered it and turned it into a mini meme, I guess. I found comments about it, but I didn't find any actual videos about it, so yeah. As someone who has played this for about a grand total of 36 minutes, I could say that a third of it is dedicated to a loop of me leaving the lane open. Boxing. Video games. America. As an American who loves boxing video games, we had a plethora of games to choose from. From your fight nights, to your ready to rumbles, to your good Mike Tysons, to your bad Mike Tysons. Even these games called Victorious Boxers. These games are based on a manga called Hajime no Ippo. There are a lot of games in this franchise, but you notice that only three ever came here. The first and the third were on the PS2, and there was one on the Wii. The second one on PS2 is Japan only, and that's the one that has my interest peaked. Now, admittedly, I know nothing of this anime, and I'm not a big traditional anime guy in general, outside of Dragon Ball and Yu Yu Hakusho and that kid who was solving murders on Adult Swim at like one in the morning. I'm mostly in this for the boxing experience and have no connection to this story or the characters. Maybe that's an interesting angle for this video, or maybe you'll wish a quicker death on me because of that fact. In any event, here's Hajime no Ippo 2, Victorious Road. Now jumping into this game, it looks good for the most part. We have fighter introductions, the animations all look good, and so do the arenas. I guess the only thing you can criticize is the character models looking a little odd. I mean, look at this dude. This is a 100,000 yard stare if I've ever seen one. This guy has seen some shit, and I ain't just talking about in the boxing ring. You best believe if I had a dude who was looking at me like this, I'm throwing in the towel, I'm throwing in my gloves, I'm throwing in the trunks, I'm throwing in my mouth guard. Literally anything that signifies me giving up. I'm straight up power walking my ass out of there. They can also look a little weird when they're moving around with the mocap animation. It kind of comes across as a dude in a mascot suit sometimes. This isn't just exclusive to this game. There are a ton of games that are based on 2D cartoons that struggle to translate into a 3D environment. Shout out to, quite frankly, every early to mid 2000s Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon game. So you can't really give the game too much flack, but let's talk about what's important the gameplay. Now stepping into a fight at first would make you believe your controller is broken. The controls aren't really all that responsive and you do these involuntary movements like you have Tourette's but without the cursing. Bobbing for invisible apples, playing invisible limbo. What the hell is going on here? Well, this is a trap. I went into the settings and changed the left stick to expert instead of default. I don't know why the default movement is this and the expert movement is just moving normally from what I can tell. Next I made one of the top buttons to sway. This is so we can freely use head movement. And I changed the camera to side fix so we have none of this rotating shit that's going on with the camera work here. And last, but certainly the trolliest, was the left stick is angled at 9 degrees. By default, like this had to be a prank by one of the developers, I don't see a reason to do this. I angled mine at 90 degrees so left and right can be forward and backwards. After doing all that, we can get into gameplay and this is a pretty damn fun game of boxing. While you can easily assume that the game will have brainless combat, you'd be wrong. Very wrong. This is one of those games that's hard to learn and hard to master. As of this recording, I don't even think I'm good at it yet. You have your jabs, hooks, uppercuts, but using them effectively is rewarding. Different inputs with the punch button get different results, like leaning and throwing a hook will give you this punishing overhand. Pushing the stick in forward then pressing the jab button will throw a step in jab. Sidestepping and throwing a hook is almost guaranteed to get a stumble if you connect with it right. Dead from the neck up, dead from the neck down, but that's life. 
The boxing gloves themselves are something to get around. Throwing certain punches from certain distances from certain stances could result in you making contact with your opponent's glove or elbow. Once you connect with a big shot, you can either stumble the fighter back or they enter in a dazed state where you have a chance to dish out free CTE. This leads to one of my favorite parts of the game, the knockdowns. Wait, what? A barrel roll? Now you have any kind of knockdown that you can possibly think of. You have your brutal ones. You have knockdowns where the character's T-bowing. You can knock down someone into a Fortnite revive pose. And my favorite, you could just have these guys chicken dancing. Looking like a dizzy bat race competitor, or he was just hit with a sassafras from Meta and Nettie. These bros are on another planet right now. There are special moves in the game too. There are certain punches, combinations, a headbutt, and everyone's favorite boxing move, the ability to slow down time. Missed. Missed. There's no blocking in this game, or at least that I know of, but I'm fine with it because it keeps the action moving, especially with the head movement. Also, fighters with specific stances like Ippo here can cover a good portion of their face and body with their gloves by default. Combining all this makes the game deeper than initially thought. It's not perfect. My biggest gripe is that there is no stamina system in this game at all. You can start the move slower if you keep using your super moves, but there's nothing to stop you from throwing forever. And the CPU in this game keeps throwing and throwing and throwing and throwing and throwing and throwing and throwing. I know it was an intentional design choice to keep you in the action, but you should be punished for throwing this many punches and having a percentage that's way lower than my grammar percentage for this very script. What a idiot! Of course, there are minor gripes. When you get knocked down, it's up to the game to decide if you get up or not. And there's no instant replay, which makes getting a thumbnail harder than it needs to be. Come on, Japanese exclusive game that was released two decades ago. Weren't you specifically thinking of me and my YouTube channel when making your game? There's this arcade mode. I think what's going on here is that you're playing through the important fights in the series. The fights are fun, but they have a little bit of a difficulty curve problem. There are certain fights I breeze past, then there are certain fights that take me forever. I guess this is tradition on this channel at this point whenever I play a combat sports game, but when I go up against this guy, he just wrecks my shit. This dude was like the last boss because he's killing me like Isaac Frost. <laughs> hey, that rhymed. After what seemed like forever, I finally beat him, but there were more fights after him and I just beat everyone else rather easily, at least in the first act. Yeah, that's right. This arcade mode is split up into four acts, so there is some content here. But let's get to the main event, Boxer's Road. This is a career mode, a very in-depth career mode. But come on, how in-depth could it be, right? Glucose, amino acid, melanin. Yeah! yeah, I've never heard of a fatty acid rating in, well, anything. But before we get to that, we create our guy. Here we could choose a start date, and from what I've researched, you can pick a date and those circles are the big moments that happen in the manga. You pick where you're from, I pick the good old USA. Pick your gym and you're dumped into the main career mode. This is the part you may want to get a guide, whether it's this one on Game Facts or one of these other ones. It's optional and you can experiment on your own if you want to. Thankfully, the game is, for the most part, ran in good old English, but you may want to have a handy Google Lens to translate some occasional text boxes. All right. So glucose, meals, a timeline? What is this, Windows Movie Maker? Fighting itself is not really a gigantic emphasis in this mode. It's mostly about getting to the fight itself. You do that by filling up your timeline for the day with a training regimen and a meal plan. This affects your ratings, your fatigue, and your weight. If you are eating a ton of fatty food while lifting weights, you add on both fat and muscle, which may be good for your power ratings, but you have to remember that there are weight classes in this game and you have to stick to one and be on weight. So if you're overweight, you could put on this weight coach mode, but this dude will essentially put you on a damn 
photosynthesis diet of just water and cardio dioxide. You'll drop weight with this, but your fatigue will skyrocket and your stats will plummet. You want to see how your boxer fights with a high fatigue rating? Like you've activated bullet time mode in Max Payne. You need to utilize the calendar a little. Having days off a couple times a week can help out with the whole fatigue thing. Also, keep in mind that you are training to fight someone. You can look at a video of your opponent. Oh, let's see what this guy's made of. What the hell is this little dude trying to fight this big guy for? Yeah, that went about as well as I expected. Should be an easy win for me. This is number one bullshit. Not only am I getting bodied by half a human, I got very fat and missed weight many times. So we wanted to avoid both of those things preferably. On my second attempt, I experimented a little more trying to find a good meal plan, but it can be a challenge depending on the region. Since I picked the USA, they give me the Joey Chestnut Glizzy meal plan. You can mess around with these sliders and have an automated plan for training and meals picked out for you. But I only recommend this at the start since you have, I think a year before you start taking on fights. Use that time to bulk up. When you do take a fight, pick a decent amount of time to train. This can allow plenty of time to train and cut weight. You can also set up a sparring session on your calendar. What, they let you fight a, a flyweight? Damn, at least I could beat up this small person. So I stay on weight. Until I don't. So I just say, screw it. I've been a cruiserweight this whole time, but now I'm moving up to heavyweight. I mean, look at all these stats and menus. Can you really blame me? Now take a good look at how I bulked up. Have you ever seen a man built like this? Why use a knife to cut something when you could just use the muscles on my back instead? Of course, I flatlined my opponents. Pretty sure I just got a vegetable that wasn't a part of my meal plan. So it's looking like I'm destined to be the greatest heavyweight on the face of the earth, but I got lazy and missed weight at heavyweight, which ended my game. How do you even miss weight at heavyweight? That's like getting a hundred year prison sentence and actually living to see the end of it. Nobody was expecting that shit. <laughs> Overall, this career mode is unexpectedly deep and one of the good ones. No matter what sports game it is, the career modes stay formulaic. You'll do some training mini game, play the actual game, sign the occasional contract, and I don't know, get tweets or text messages or some dumb shit like that. This career mode is one of the only games I've seen to have a balance between life choices. You're punished for being lazy. I would have loved to have seen some things added in a future installment. The use of money in general, living arrangements, etc. But Hajime no Ippo would get sequels, just none of them featuring this mode ever again. I guess it wasn't popular? Maybe I'm alone when I praise it, but I don't know. I like it. Overall, this is a nice hidden gem. Any game that lets you look like you took steroids at least five times a day has to be good. Throughout this channel, we've seen it all. Nicktoons playing baseball, Jerry Rice's dog playing football, Michael Jordan indiscriminately killing monsters with a basketball, and wrestling twisted metal. But what if I told you that the sport that has the most absurd amount of weird games is actually golf? Hear me out. I know golf can be one of the most mundane sports to look at on the surface, and that's why you immediately doubt me. But man, I'm telling you. This is a golf game. So let's crash on into some of these games, and I'm not talking about Tiger Woods. And normally I hate this kind of stuff, but considering this is one of my longer videos and I paid for a good portion of these games, if you enjoyed this at all, feel free to pretend that Abby's golf club here is your mouse cursor and the head she hits is the like button. Well, this just looks like a regular golf game to me. 
Ah, I see what kind of game this is. What the golf is just madness. Your objective is to reach the flag. You control a ball. Sometimes. Sometimes it's a golf ball. Sometimes it's a golf club. Sometimes it's the hole itself. You can be a soccer ball. A soccer goal. A box. A house. Flappy Bird, Angry Bird, Mario, The Shooting Radical, Chair, Vase, Lawn Mowing Viking Turtle, Dance Dance Revolution, Art Giraffe, Robot, Barrel, cow, TV, cow, Guy, cheap, Slime, Space, cat, Ball, hook, Trophy, a shoe, Archer, Jenga. Olympics. When you enter a level of what the golf, you have no idea what you'll be playing as. I mean, I'm hammer throwing toast into a toaster in a golf game. You just gotta go with it. Normally games like this rely on their weirdness to hide from the lack of good gameplay, but what the golf varies it up enough for things to not get boring. Yes, most of the game could be described as get your weird ass thing into the flag, but sometimes you can be platforming in a Mario type clone, or you can be in space with each planet having their own gravitational pull, or you'll be playing Katamari. It all works. The physics, the art style, and most importantly, my curiosity are all met. Even if you get bored of what the golf, you would want to keep going because you just want to see what these crazy troubled soul developers keep coming up with next. You are a golf ball in this little hub world where you go from theme to theme. After a certain amount, you eventually have a boss fight against the computer. Each level has alternative objectives that you can do if you want to be a completionist. After the campaign, there are even more things you could do, like a two player mode, other themed adventures, and even a level creator if you want to play what other crazy bastards create. Or you yourself could be that crazy bastard and create what you want. While I could see criticisms of the fact that the game is just silly, who cares? If you looked at any type of footage, you knew what this game would be. It's stupid, silly fun that's good for some laughs. It's actually nothing really like golf, more of a puzzle game, honestly, but it's nothing that's meant to be taken too seriously. Maybe it's a little too stupid, as I feel like I've gotten dumber since playing it. You see all these mistakes in the script? That's the what the golf effect right there. Aqua Teen Hunger Force Zombie Ninja Pro-Am. <laughs> Just rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? This game is based off the Adult Swim TV show, and I remember seeing commercials of this game, and I always wondered, how did this show get a game and a movie? Put your pitchforks down, I'm actually a fan of the series. But it's fairly niche, especially compared to its contemporaries. But anyway, starting up Aqua Teen Zombies, you notice that the game actually looks surprisingly good. Yes, this is an emulator running in HD, but I'm more so talking about how the character designs from the show smoothly translate over to 3D. Looking at other games like Ed and Eddie try to do this while having characters that look like a blind man made them based on description alone. What the fuck is that? We actually have a story here. Frylock is invited to a golf course while Shake and Miwa tag along. You break some of Carl's windows and you're in the game. You play as Master Shake, who's a milkshake, which would be a little strange to see a cup playing golf generally, but it's like not even the top 10 weird things I've played as in this video so far. You play golf just how you would in any 3D golf game with this start and stop meter for power and accuracy. If that was it, I wouldn't have even included it in this video. When you take your shot, you yourself have to travel to the ball. Along the way, you'll run into some sorts of monsters and enemies. So in between each shot you are engaging in combat some of the worst combat i might add i think the only combat that can be worse than this is if you lick the shit that kills the roaches and even that's debatable as shake you just mash the x button until everything stops moving you once in a while get a temporary weapons and you can even switch to frylock but none of it is any fun besides fighting there are items placed all over the levels which give you power-ups like meatwad rolling with the golf ball meatwad i need your help
This is awkward. The golf courses are pretty varied, but I got hit with some bullshit. There's this level where the hole is surrounded by a dome. The only way you can get the ball into the hole is to hit it in one of these many teleporters. The concept of this is dumb in general because the only way you can get a good score on this level is trial and error because you don't know which teleporters to hit it through. But besides all that, once I got the right teleporter, the ball just straight up missed the hole and I was screwed. I used the mulligan which brought the ball back out of the dome, but the teleporter is destroyed once you use it so I had no way of getting the ball back in there. So I started over and did it from the beginning and it happened again. I went on top of the dome and then I'm somehow in the dome. This makes about as much sense as the show so I guess it's on brand. I have to mention that even exploring the levels isn't even fun. You can really benefit from a sprint button. I mean look at this. Damn. Come on. Oh my God. Holy cannoli. Oh my God. Also, the quality of voice clips is terrible. Okay, boneheads, listen up. I'm going to teach you the finer points of the game. First, you'll learn how to drive the ball. Looks like we're short on space, so we'll just drive into Carl's windows. He won't mind. What? Like, did the actors record this while the mic was in another room? And the overuse of the same lines is very annoying. Hey, where's that lady with the drink card? 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 Ah, I just can't get that snack card lady out of my mind. She's fancy. Hey, where's that lady with the drink card? That love mummy is a real pack rat. His possessions are valueless and plentiful. Avoid those and you may have a clean shot at the hole. Good thing that wind stopped. Otherwise, this hole would have been interesting. Is that Scott Van Pelt? The hell is he doing here? The only other gameplay thing worth mentioning is these little golf cart races you can do, which has the most blatant rubber banding I've ever seen in a game. Lay it down. Besides that, you can watch episodes of the actual show and look at the trailer of Black Sight Area 51. Cool, I guess. Overall, Aqua Teen is mediocrity personified. The golf is pretty blah and the combat is no Devil May Cry. Actually, it's a guarantee that Devil will cry if he were to play this. Kirby in golf? Don't worry, it's pretty good. Kirby's Dream Course is one of the funnest spins on video game golf you can possibly play. And I'm not just saying that because you can make the ball spin, I'm not that creative with this script. It's a game where your objective is to slaughter every enemy in your way, but it's in mini golf form. When you take shots, you have to hit the enemies. If you don't, you lose health and eventually die. The game gives you so many tools like adding a curve to your shots or doing these pop shots. You have to utilize these in order to traverse around these stages which have obstacles themselves. Some enemies you kill give you powers like the umbrella, the rock, and my favorite, fire. Okay, this one actually sucks. Combining all of your abilities in one single move is one of the most satisfying things you could do in any of these games. Yep, getting perfect pop shots into holes. Don't clip that audio, please. Even the aesthetic and music all give off that Kirby vibe. At least I think it does, I have no idea. The only exposure I had to this little pink con ball with shoes is Smash Brothers and that anime that aired on like Saturday mornings. I always thought he was Jigglypuff's brother when I was younger. Anyway, the two player mode is the real highlight. You have to get stars and you get stars by killing enemies, but you could steal those stars or you can even hit a switch that swaps the amount of stars you have. You can even use your powers to attack your opponent and screw them over. That's 
one of the main things with this game. You screw over the other person, which leads to a lot of broken friendships and divorces. And oh, man, I think you may even hate your dog if he can play this game with you. Kirby's Dream Course is a great game. The only thing that I hate is that there aren't more courses. Any game that gives you an umbrella and calls it a power has to be good, right? Okay, I'll be relatively brief with this one because King of Clubs is not really all that weird and it's not really all that good. This is just a standard mini golf game with some kind of unique courses, but it's just all very generic and uninteresting to look at. The graphics are ugly, the gameplay is boring, and the music is just, well... You also have this one thing where you can hit gophers, I guess. Eh? Even searching the game on YouTube, one of the first results is this LimeWire quality ass video where the guy recording yawns. <sighs> yeah, that about sums it up right there, I'd say. There aren't too many games that are so obscure that they are relegated to videos that have worse quality than a cartel beheading video. You might be asking why I included it in this video if it's not all that weird. Well, I thought it would be, and I didn't want the footage to go to waste, so there you go. It makes the top nine games of the video. Unfortunately, I'm only playing nine games, and the one through eight spots are already taken. Just in case you thought golf was missing more ninjas. Well, here you go. So you start ninja golf by golfing with a ninja. Once you, <laughs> once you, <laughs> once you hit the ball, you have to run after it for your next hit. But on your way to the ball, you're interrupted by ninjas, giant frogs, and whatever the hell this is, a gopher? Looks like you can really use a golf cart. When fighting these enemies, it's more so a 2D side scroller. You exclusively kick these enemies and that's really all there is to this game. Each part of the course is considered its own area. Meaning that if I'm on the green, that's different than being on the grass, which is different than being in the sand, which is different than being in the water where you have to karate kick sharks. There's some strategy involved here. You have a pretty good idea how each part works, so maybe you shoot around the green to be on the grass more, or vice versa. It's up to you. At the end of each hole, you fight a dragon, which you throw shuriken stars at to kill it. The game doesn't even let you putt. Real ninjas don't putt. Either way, after a couple of levels, the game just throws an absurd amount of enemies at you to up the difficulty. I can't imagine picking the hardest difficulty, which is called Kamikaze, and I ain't talking World War II. Unfortunately, there's not much else to the game, even if it is an older game. It doesn't even really have any kind of music either, so you just hear Ninja Golf Man salt shaker footsteps and exploding enemies. Ninja Golf is a weird game that purely survives off of the novelty of the title alone. Ninja Golf. It's just a great title. No matter if it's a game, movie, or it's some type of porno, you piqued my interest already. Despite these being mechs and the anime aesthetic, these robots are 100% American because they use the imperial system of measurement. Or maybe they're one of these other countries that also use it. I guess 30.48 meter robots just isn't as catchy. At the very least, 100 foot robot golf lives up to the title. I can't confirm if these robots are 100 feet, but they are playing golf. And just like Ninja Golf, the title does a good job of getting my interest, but the actual game itself is pretty unremarkable. The big draw to this game is that you golf and have free reign over your robot. You can stomp around, fly, hit opposing golfers, destroy buildings, but here's the thing with robot golf. Describing it and actually playing it are two different things. It sounds fun, and the picture in your head is fun, but it's just not. Hitting a golfer just stuns them for a second, and that's it. Flying is just a slow hover, and you get these special abilities, but a lot of them aren't really all that useful from what I can tell. Like some robots have this little dash, and some can shoot lasers that don't hit anything. It's just all very unsatisfying. The only thing that's kinda cool is the fact that buildings or other structures get in your way, and you can knock them down to clear a pathway. As for the actual golf, it's the least enjoyable golf I've ever played for a video game. 
outside of that hick golf or whatever I was talking about earlier. For starters, every ball hit is like in low gravity. I thought this was because I was on the moon or underwater, but even on plane levels, it's still mostly the same. It's an odd choice. Why would you make a game about golf, one of the slower sports you can possibly watch, and somehow make it even slower? The whole game just seems like it was meant to be this trolling type of game because you could just freely block player shots and mess with opposing golfers. The courses are badly designed as well. There are so many spots on these courses where the ball gets stuck and it's just irritating. Combining that with these very floaty physics leads to stuff like this. Okay, so we're just gonna hit this ball and uh, I don't know why it's going straight up in the air. Okay, it's coming right back down, right where it was, okay. Again. Oh, <laughs> it's doing it again. <laughs> okay, let's try again. That's so good. It's like a uh, here. How uh, Fuck this. We have a campaign mode too, and I just. I, I honestly just don't get it. It's very poorly voice acted with these actors that sound like they're recording these lines over a Zoom call with the PS5 controller as their microphone. Ah, yes, fantastic. I'm thinking the next recruit would be your final television sparring partner. Ernie? He's never coming back to Robot Golf again. My charm and presence just couldn't be matched, and he went back to doing his, uh... Successful use vehicle business? That sounds right. What the fuck is this? I guess it's supposed to be a satire of poorly dubbed English anime. I genuinely don't know. I put it this way. If it's not a parody, it's some of the worst voice acting and cutscenes you could possibly look for in gaming. If it is a parody, it's just not funny in the slightest. Playing the campaign is essentially a race to the hole as opposed to traditional golf. I'd avoid this. There's a chance that I just don't understand the game, but you shouldn't need context to enjoy a video game. The character designs are really cool, and I like the fact that each character has their own unique little minigame to swing the club. That's about it. Any game that can have five corgis pilot a mega zord and still be bad is like impossible. I have no idea how they did it. Cheap golf. Uh, it's not cheap, it's inexpensive. What we have here is a normal golf game that uses Atari graphics. Nothing strange here. Nope. Nothing at all. Can't think of a single thing. Okay, so this is one of those cliche games where everything is deeper than it appears to be. Ooh. Yeah, so your goal here is to get your square, which is supposed to be a ball, into a black square, which is supposed to be a hole. Supposed to be a hole? I wrote hole as in hole with a W. I swear to God, I am dumb. You have to do this with a certain par so you don't have unlimited shots. Each hole you complete gets this little text directed at you which is an AI named Susan that's slowly coming to life throughout the game. I can assure that this Susan is more human than the YouTube one. As you play more and as Susan gets more and more unhinged, the levels get crazier and crazier. Like look at this. Much like American hero Johnny Sins, this game is more than just putting things into holes. There are levels where you have to avoid these red things that kill you and there can even be levels where you have to collect keys to open teleporters that teleport you to other teleporters that teleport you to the hole. It's a lot. It's kind of funny because after a level like that, you can get one like this, which is almost impossible to fail. It's fascinating that every person, no matter their skill set or experience, knows how to play a golf game. You either get the pull and release style or the stop and start for accuracy and power. I don't know, that's just something that came to my mind when playing this for some reason. Susan asks you questions every once in a while because the game's deep. And funny enough, they can link you to an actual site that's in theme with the game. I'm over the whole concept of deeper meaning in any type of media, but this is a nice touch. Overall, cheap golf is a fun time. I personally could do without the AI stuff, and I'm not talking about Iverson, but I enjoyed playing it. Much like What the Golf, cheap golf works more like a puzzle game that has golf mechanics rather than just being golf. But I like this one for the most part. Well, that makes one person. Okay, 
Here we go, the Outlaw games. These have been on my bucket list for a while, and while I expected to make a video on them by itself, I just couldn't resist talking about the golf ones here. Outlaw Golf goes for the crude, edgy route. I mean, what other game lets you use a dominatrix chick to beat up her fat sub? Now that, my friends, was a major league ass kick. Uh, yeah, this is a golf game, right? Yep, it is. And we have a list of colorful characters here like Stripper, Redneck, and White Rapper. While cliche, the characters aren't bad, they have a certain charm to them. When getting into the game, you may recognize the commentator. Hailing from the rough and tumble, crime ridden inner city streets of Beverly Hills, wannabe rapper Ice Trey dropped out of school to pursue his dream of rapping and playing golf, a decision that was about as promising as his single digit SAT score. Caddying for Ice Trey is his one man posse, spinner, and tattoo consultant. Fresh fruit. Yep, that's Steve Carell. First Scott Van Pelt and now him. What's with these golf games and having the ability to lure in these commentators? Another thing I've noticed is that these games have similarities to some EA Sports big games. The character select screen looks exactly like the character select screen from the first SSX game. And a transition to a character cutscene really reminds me of NFL Street. Like, tell me not. Yes, indeedy Rudy, that's gonna make you feel good about your golf game. Yeah, baby, give me a taste, brother. I don't know if this is coincidence or what. Jumping into the game, you'll be disappointed or relieved to find out that this is pretty much just golf with window dressing. It's good golf, don't get me wrong. The commentary is pretty funny, but since this is a golf game, there has to be 700 jokes about holes and strokes and whatnot. Trixie's handicap is her mouth. And Steve Carell's commentary, while funny, it sounds a bit too cut and paste like SmackDown Shut Your Mouth commentary or a YouTube poop from like 2008. Killer Miller has this putt to save par. The thing that gets me to constantly laugh most is, believe it or not, this one guy in the crowd laughing when you take a bad shot. <laughs> Like man, whoever did that laugh, give them a raise. But the gameplay is pretty good. You pull your club back and with the right stick, you push it forward to swing. Timing controls the power and if you push the right stick forward at an angle, you hook or push the ball. You also have the ability to curve the shot or put some spin on the ball. For putting, you have to consider the hills and the slopes and the game gives you a ghost route to help you out. You only have three uses though. Going into the weird territory, you have a composure meter that gets affected if you make good or bad shots. You can refill your composure meter by beating up your caddy. Now that beating went the distance. If I put balls in the sand, you get my backhand. The main mode for this game is tournament mode, where you take a golfer and go through 30 courses and unlock clubs and balls. The courses are very well designed, and I just wish there was more than a regular one, a shitty looking polluted Pittsburgh looking ass place, and Texas. Just three courses really. And really outside of playing with friends, that's really about it. On the surface, Outlaw Golf probably looks like a crazy game, but it's just a golf game with a lot of theatrics and some quirky dialogue. But wait, there's more. Yep, there's a sequel. There's actually more than a sequel, but I'm not playing these Christmas expansions. I find it kind of funny that this is one of these blockbuster exclusives. Like the equivalent would be me making a new video and posting it to like daily motion or something. If you notice the first Outlaw Golf game was rated T for teen and the second one is rated M for mature. Why? Enhance. Yes, that's right. You have some very premium content kind of clothes, if you know what I mean. You even have a cheat code to CSI enhance boobs. Doesn't work for the guys, though. 
Besides potentially demonetizable outfits, Outlaw Golf 2 doesn't add too much new to the game. You have the stuff from the first game, the characters, the humor, the beatings. It's taser time! Feel the burn! But some new things too. Firstly, there's licensed music in the game, which makes things a little bit more lively than the elevated music from the first game. The golf itself is mostly the same. You can now stop the meter to go over 100% and you have this ghost ball. It gives you a little preview of your lined up shot. Can only be used once per hole though. Probably the biggest new thing that's been added is the ability to drive a golf cart. You get a golf cart to do several objectives like running over people. Chase. If you do the objective, you get a special shot. Not to bring up SSX again, but going from Outlaw Golf 1 to Outlaw Golf 2 is like going from SSX to SSX Tricky. Both sequels are improvements of the first game, so much that they make the first game obsolete by result. But having said that, there's nothing really new in the game. It's just the same game, but better. And that's it for now. Anyway, I don't know. It's up to you as there's more games I can definitely play. But I'll stop at nine because that's an odd number. And I know that there's going to be someone out there that's unreasonably upset that I stopped at an odd number. To rank all of these games real quick, I'll have to say the worst one is uh Whatever the name of that one game is, hopefully I have the cover on the screen or some gameplay, whatever. Eighth would be the 100 foot robot golf game. Seventh would be Aqua Teen. Sixth is Ninja Golf, love the name. Fifth is Outlaw Golf 1. Fourth is Cheap Golf. Third is Outlaw Golf 2. Second is What the Golf. And the first is Kirby. We golfed with AI, fast food, Kirby, and whatever else you can think of. What did we learn? We need more ninjas in sports video games.